Uh, yeah, we're now live on YouTube, Joe. Perfect. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to this next meeting of the Climate Change, Environment, and Growth Executive Advisory Panel. Um, firstly, thank you to everybody for accommodating the slightly earlier start time for the meeting on this occasion. Um, much appreciated. As ever, we've got a particularly interesting agenda this morning, um, and I'll be really keen to hear the views of members on the matters we're discussing. Uh, I can see that we've got Councillor uh, Tebbett joining us this morning due to the agenda items, um, which link through to the work that he's doing with Councillor Brackenbury. So thank you for joining us. Um, as ever, with all the discussions we have, the input that members make at these meetings is really important in informing the decisions that we make as a council. Um, I can think of one of the, the recent examples that springs to mind is in relation to air quality and officers have clearly taken the feedback of members on board from in relation to this. Um, and, and so it is important in informing directly what we are doing. Um, so we will crack on now and take the first agenda item, which is apologies for absence. Yeah, um, we've received apologies from uh, Councillor Jan O'Hara and Councillor Des Del, and Councillor Fedorovich is attending as a substitute for Councillor Del. Perfect, thank you. And I believe Councillor Bone um, will be joining us shortly. Um, so moving on to agenda item two, which is declarations of interest. So have we got any to declare? Doesn't look like it. That's fine. So agenda item three um, is the minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of March. Hopefully members will have had the opportunity to read through these. So if there are any issues, um, please Raise your hand now. No, nope. okay, we're all looking happy with those. So we'll accept those minutes. And now for the exciting part, moving on to the substantive, first substantive item, which um, we're going to be talking about biodiversity uh, net gain. So I'm going to hand over to one of the officers to take us through the presentation on that. And I believe that is Sue Bateman. Thank you very much and um, good morning everybody. Yeah, I'm going to um, start off if that's okay and then I'm going to hand over to um, Andra who will, who will tell you a bit about habitat opportunity mapping and natural capital and then the intention was hopefully we can have a discussion and you can ask us any questions. So um, the um, purpose of the report is really to um, try and raise awareness of um, biodiversity net gain and some of the potential implications that has for us as um, a local authority. I wasn't intending to go to, through the report um, in detail as there's obviously a really lot of information in there. What I thought would be helpful is if I um, highlight what I think are the, the real key messages to get across. Um, and, and as I say, then we can hopefully have a, have a discussion about it. So the um, Environment Act um, 2021 has already introduced this mandatory requirement for a 10% biodiversity net gain. So we know that's gonna happen. What we don't know yet is all of the detail, and that's what this recent consultation was about. Um, it, it was setting out some of the um, implications and the regulations that are, are likely to come along, along with that. But I think the first thing to say is it's really good news for the um, environmental improvement, and it will enable us to create better developments for our communities. But it is a really fundamental change to the way um, development will be um, considered in the future. And it will therefore have huge practical implications um, and particularly in, in the short term as we, as we get to grips with this new way of working. And I think the other thing to say is we need to set it in the context of lots of other changes that are happening um, in terms of the Environment Act and the government's 25 year um, environment improvement plan. And I've listed some of those changes um, in um, paragraph 4.5 of the report. Now, one of the main implications for the council um, will be in the delivery of our planning service. So Appendix A of the report sets out um, a summary of how that's intended to operate at various stages. And um, biodiversity gains and losses are going to be measured through um, a bio measuring biodiversity units through a metric. And this uses habitats as a proxy 
for biodiversity. And the metric is basically just a large, very complicated spreadsheet. Um, and, and Natural England has already published a metric that's known as biodiversity 3.0. And we're expecting an update of that uh, 3.1 in the next month or so. Uh, and the um, regulations will specify which metric um, developers will, will need to use. Now there's been a lot of focus um, on biodiversity offsetting or um, gains off site or habitat creation banks. But I think it's really important to emphasize that this mitigation hierarchy still applies. So our first aim is to avoid or reduce biodiversity impacts through how we select sites and through um, master planning. So when we're looking at producing our local plan, we should be avoiding the most sensitive sites in the first place and not allocating those for development. And when um, applicants are looking at master planning the sites, they should be looking at what's important on the site already, whether that's um, uh, streams, whether it's hedgerows and incorporating those into the master planning. Then the second stage is they should be um, looking to enhance and restore biodiversity on the site. And that's about creating green infrastructure, open spaces, using the sustainable urban drainage systems on the site and creating new habitat that way. If they can't get to this 10% net gain through that, through all of those measures, it's at that stage we look at um, off-site um, opportunities. Um, and they, they can create those through um, habitats on, on land that they own, or they can actually buy these biodiversity units because there's expected to be a marketplace for biodiversity units and they can buy those biodiversity units from, from anywhere in, in the UK. Um, and then as a very last resort, if there are no biodiversity units available, then the government is going to be able to sell what they call biodiversity credits. And that's got to be a last resort. But the reason for having that last resort is obviously we can't stop development from happening. We need the, the new homes and new jobs. And so there has to be a fallback position where developers can buy credits if, if there's nothing available locally. But the important point to remember is that the metric does prioritise local enhancements. And that's through what's something that's called um, a spatial risk multiplier. And it incentivises local priorities through um, a strategic significance score. But the metric's only a tool um, and the outputs from this, this spreadsheet effectively and the biodiversity game plans that the developers have to submit to discharge their pre-commencement condition, they still need to be assessed by ecological experts um, because they will need to assess whether the, the mitigation hierarchy that I've just talked about has been correctly applied and they need to check whether the type, the extent and the condition of the habitats both before the development and after the development have been correctly recorded. That's not something that a planning officer, for example, is going to be able to do because they won't have those skill sets. Now, the government has recognised that this has huge resource requirements um, and they've already provided us with some funding for that. But I think you know, that, that there's going to be more issues for that going forward. And I think nationally, you know, there, there's going to be a huge demand for ecologists, both from the development side and from um, local authority side. So it's going to be interesting to see how, how that plays out. Um, so local nature recovery strategies are also a requirement of the Environment Act. And they're going to be required across the whole country. And the, the purpose of those is to identify the existing biodiversity resource and to identify the priorities for nature recovery in the area. Now, their importance for biodiversity net gain is that they'll be identifying the priority areas for this strategic significance score um, as part of the biodiversity metric. And it's how we will ensure that we get real local improvements, because through our local nature recovery strategy, we can identify what our local priorities are. Um, now, we're anticipating that the responsibility for producing these local nature recovery strategies will rest with the council. Um, but I understand that hasn't actually been formally confirmed yet, although we have got some funding towards starting our work on that. Um, there's been some pilot areas, there's been five pilots across the country so far, and they've all gone about it in a slightly different way. There's going to be guidance for us on, on how we should do that. But um, the message is very much that it's got to be a collaborative process. It's got to be with our partners, um, both within the council and outside um, and, and through, our, through our local nature partnership. 
we in Northamptonshire are already very well placed to start our work on this. Um, and Andra, as I said, is going to talk a little bit more about it than, than, than I am. But we, we've, we, we've been working on um, habitat opportunity mapping for a number of years. And, and we've already started work on a natural capital investment plan. And that will feed into this work. But that won't be the, the whole job. There's still going to be uh, lots more we need to do on that. And then the final point I wanted to mention is that there is this option for us as a council to decide whether we as a landowner wish to identify opportunities for habitat enhancement on our own land and sell those biodiversity units and effectively enter this marketplace. So this could um, potentially offer a good opportunity to deliver offsetting locally. It will um, offer the opportunity to fund the enhancements of um, country parks, uh, lo local um, open space, for example. And it could also help us with um, other targets that we have, obviously, in terms of net zero um, carbon targets. But there's again much work to be done before we could determine whether this is something that we would want to be involved in but it is anticipated that the full cost of delivering that so the full cost of um, creating the enhancements managing that uh, purchasing the equipment administering that that's all would be covered in the cost that you sell the biodiversity units for um, and that has to be um, for 30 years so uh, that's it from me. I'm going to hand over to Andra before we go into the questions. Thank you, Sue. Um, we thought it would be useful for members to understand some of the work that we've been doing, um, both within North North, Council, North North Hants Council and previously when um, I was part of the Joint Planning Unit. And we started back, um, it was probably about 2013, as part of the Nen Valley Nature Improvement Area. And one of the themes within that was around ecosystem services. So that stream of work collected all the information around ecosystem services across Northamptonshire and Peterborough as, as along the Nen Valley at the time, well, still is. Um, and that work was quite fundamental and put us in a very good place to then move on to looking at habitat opportunity mapping. And that's across pretty much every field area that you can um, see in North Northamptonshire. And this shows a variety of different opportunities. Um, I'm just gonna read the list. We've got opportunities for biodiversity, surface water runoff, air pollution, noise pollution, local climate, and access to natural green space. So you can see that we can start to um, understand where the best locations are to undertake improvements to the natural environment to get the most benefits. And you start layering those up and you get the multifunctionality that we want to see through for the environment. So that work's got lots of potential. And one of the things that we've now moved on to as a partnership working with the um, Environment Agency in Natural England, is to work on a natural capital investment plan. And in fact, that has been funded through some um, environment agency money. So within that, we've got a, a list of projects, both that are happening and some that are also aspirational that looks at what areas of land and what target areas we've got for improving um, any sort of natural capital in the area. We're just moving on to the next stage, which is a cost benefit analysis of each of those projects. And we'll be looking at prioritizing those to a certain extent. And as Sue says, this document will then have many uses, mainly to inform the local nature recovery strategy that um, we're still waiting for the further guidance on. And as you can see, we then start to come full circle with this piece of work on how that will then help us to get the local biodiversity net gain in the places that we want to see it as a council, rather than having to look at offsetting in other parts of the country where we wouldn't see the development, um, the benefit alongside the development it has. So um, I thought that would be useful to set out for councillors to show that we are in a good place. And in fact, we were um, sort of leading the way, if you like, and most further, far, far in advance of what other councils were doing in the ARC area. Everyone is catching up, though, and they're all undertaking their habitat opportunity mapping as well. But there's not many places that have started their natural capital investment plan work yet. So we're looking at um, building on this advantage uh, for when the um, further guidance comes out to make sure that we can get all that local benefit. And um, that's as, as well as that, we have um, various key projects that are happening within the area around the Rockingham Forest and also the EYES partnership, which I think you'll be having a report come to you 
in the future about how that's being developed as a strategic piece of work. So I hope that's useful. And unless Sue's got anything else to say, we can um, see if there's any questions. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much uh, for taking us through that. It is a really interesting development that I know members um, with interest in this area will have been following, I'm sure, over recent months. So, Councillor Lee, I can see your hand has already gone up. Please do ask away. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, this is a fantastic, it's a really positive proposal. Uh, it, it's great. Um, I see that it will start in November 2023. Uh, so my question is, is there anything we can do locally to start with that earlier, to ask developers to already submit their biodiversity plans uh, earlier? That's one question. And secondly, enforcement. Um, enforcement is known to be a very tricky area. Uh, for example, there's a story in the paper today in the North France Telegraph that uh, one particular developer is building, is started to build a sixth floor on a building, whereas he should have stopped building the building because the fifth floor was already illegal and yet the building work is carrying on and we don't seem to be able to stop that. Now, measuring biodiversity gains is it, it, it's very time consuming. So uh, and sometimes it may be hard to prove, for example, uh, polluting brooks, polluting waterways mm -hmm. and the environment agencies often not taking action because it's very expensive to prove who is responsible. So I just wonder how how can the enforcement happen? Uh, but I don't want to be negative. I really want to be positive. I, I'm really excited about this. So uh, I look forward to hearing. Uh, thank you. What we can do so two, two points then. Firstly, on the date. So um, as far as we're aware, in terms of the mandatory um, biodiversity net gain, um, we're expecting that to commence two years after the original commencement of the Act. So that will be in November 2023. However, um, there is a possibility that it could be delayed until 2025. We simply don't know the answer to that question because I think it will depend on how much consult comes out of the current consultation or con consultation that's just finished and how long it takes them to get all of the various regulations in place. But notwithstanding that, we've already got a policy in North Northamptonshire that requires biodiversity net gain. That's in our current um, core spatial strategy. So we're already asking for it. We're doing that now. And we have been doing that for, for a number of years. The, the difficulty we've had in North Northamptonshire is that we've never had a specific target and we've never required a specific way of measuring it. But what we do require is a net gain. So that could be 1%, it could be 30%. It depends on the specifics of the site. But it's already happening and we're already doing it and we'll continue to do it. Um, until the, the, the mandatory um, version comes in. In terms of enforcement, another really good question. The, the intention is that monitoring requirements will be built into the um, either the conservation, uh, the conservation covenants, which will um, cover how, how these sites are delivered, or they'll be through planning conditions or through section 106 requirements. And the emphasis will be on requiring the site deliverer to monitor those um, enhancements and provide that information to the council. And then the council will then have to report on it. Obviously, if something goes wrong and they're not delivering in the way that they should, then at that point, the council might need to consider enforcement issues. And yes, that's going to be another resource implication for the council. But we don't know the scale of what that might be at this stage. But on the positive side of it, it should be, as I say, the land deliverers, the land developers monitoring that and telling us and, uh, and us um, keeping records of that. So I hope that answers the questions. Um, could I just quickly ask a follow up question? So you're saying it's the land developers who've got to report on it. Isn't that a little bit counterproductive? I mean, how? How much can you rely then on their figures? That, uh, that, yeah, that, so that they, they will be required to report to us. And that's, again, where we need this um, ecological support, because we will need to check that they are giving us the correct information. Um, and, and, and so, yes, that is a resource implication for us. But, but they, in terms of um, delivering the, um, the units, that they'll have to be registered providers. 
So there'll be some um, accreditation required. So in, in order to, to deliver a biodiversity unit, they'll have to be on a site register. They have to be um, checked out to make sure they know what they're doing. Um, they'll have to be professional, all of those kind of things. So the, the intention is it shouldn't be an issue, but of course, potentially it, it could be, and, and, and we'll need to see how it goes because we don't really yet know how this marketplace is going to work. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I, I'm sure this will develop out as we get further into it, um, the, the finer details behind it all. Um, but it's useful to have those questions around it, just to start mulling them over, which I'm sure officers are already doing in depth. Um, Councillor Federovich. Um, yeah, so I, I sort of echo a little bit what Anne's saying already. Um, I mean, my, one of my first questions was about, like, can we already bring this in? But if we've already got this in place, it'd be good to know. Obviously, enforcement is something that we can look at more. Um, but yeah, that that is something that um, w one of the main things that struck me with all of this is that we're sort of asking for biodiversity gain after the fact. Um, and that ultimately, if you sort of stepping back to what we're trying to achieve with the biodiversity net gain, whilst obviously this is a really good step in the right direction, actually having some proper um, targets and things, we're trying to run a biodiversity de decline at the moment. We're, we're, we're actually actively, um, uh, this is a, a big problem that we need to solve. Um, so realistically, if we're developing land um, and then asking for biodiversity gain after the fact, we're still going to be on a steep decline um, and that's not going to be necessarily helping that. Um, so I guess my main thing is really what can we do to ask for some of this biodiversity gain uh, before the fact to actually start getting things. Um, I don't know if this is something that we already do at the moment, um, but actually making sure that we are having some sort of gain before development starts. Um, also the different, I'd be interested, obviously it sounds like the, the, um, the scope is actually changing constantly, which is great. Uh, I think that's definitely the way it should be. So it might be just the case that um, more people can feed into that. Um, but I think uh, just the actual, like um, what we're looking at, the actual metrics, like, I'm, I'd be very interested to see if we're looking at, um, for instance, the very specific plants and things that are found on the site, um, the insects and, and like to that level of detail. And are we actually increasing those specific things uh, are we um if we're di displacing them or something like that or can we do something on site such as like having green roofs um sort of vertical gardens things like that to actually really really encourage people to increase it on the site because if you're pushing things off i mean ultimately what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of wildlife and greenery that's that's effectively destroyed <laughs> or killed um and actually doing that and then expecting that, that we'll just be able to increase insects, for instance, 110% in another site is quite um, quite difficult to do. So I'd be interested to think, like look into the, how we quantify that really. Um, I'm gonna like, just let you go uh, answer those questions for a game. <laughs> there was quite a lot in there, <laughs> so yeah. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so the whole point of this is to actually get an enhancement so it's it, it's a genuine enhancement that the environment has got to be in a better place after the development than it was before so we should be getting real actual um gains in terms of um having it before the effect um as, as you were saying is that's about choosing the sites in the first place and, and choosing them correctly and and that's how we do that through the local plan process and making sure that we're assessing sites correctly we're avoiding the most sensitive sites that of course has implications for us in our plan making because that's going to mean we're going to have to do a lot more assessments up front than we would have done before because before we would have perhaps made assumptions about uh, what could be delivered from various sites and I think going forward and you know the government put this in in the, the original planning white paper about front loading things and, and identifying up front how how sites might be developed and, 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 and those sorts of things. So yeah, the first point, you choose the sites correctly in the first place. And then when you're developing that site, when you're doing the master planning, you're, you're making sure that you're really genuinely um, making sure that the, the site will deliver an enhancement either on the site, that's the preference, or if you can't deliver it on site, 
through these offsite um, through those offsite gains. The metric isn't perfect. It's got its supporters. It's got its critics. It's only a proxy, so it only measures habitats. It doesn't measure um, specific uh, insects or specific flowers or or those kind of things. It's just looking at the habitat, so it's not perfect. And that's why when we're in planning, we have to look at the metric alongside other things. You know, if there was a particular issue about a particular species, you might want something else as well as the metric. That's for us to decide at, at, at that time. So it's a tool, it helps, it's not the total answer. Um, has that answered the question? Yeah, I, I think to some degree, obviously, like this is still a developing metric, and I think that's that's part of the, the good part of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we do need to get down to the sort of the more granular details of it. Um, and I think that hopefully will come with time um, and as we look at this further. But um, but yeah, actually really starting to have an understanding. And I mean, yeah, obviously having the like ecological studies and things like that done by an independent uh, body and not be appointed by the developer themselves, that sort of thing. And just make sure that we're actually getting a really objective view of, of what's there and how do we make sure that that is still there following the development because it's that's quite a bold thing to try and do <laughs> it, it's a, it's a huge huge difference in terms of yeah. the way we'll be dealing with planning going forward and I think yeah. that's a, you know an important point to remember that at the moment yeah. we're expecting this to relate to most applications so the um there can be exemptions and we don't know exactly yet what the exemptions are going to be because that was part of the consultation but we're expecting this to happen for most applications other than householders. So that's huge implications for a huge number of applications. And you've got to have something that, that works for everybody. You know, the, the, the developer that's building the one house can, can use it just as well as the, the developer doing the 3000 homes on the sustainable urban extension. And so it, it's not going to be perfect for every situation. We're going to have to, to work with that and work around that. Um, and I think it will evolve as, as, as things go forward. Yeah, just very quickly before I pass to Tim, um, just regarding the homeowners and because um, I noticed in our um, consultation response from the planning team uh, or planning committee that we actually, so the recommended is that home, like homeowners and small developments like that are not included or exempt. I don't think we should be doing that at all. Um, uh, the reason being is that we're, I mean, we're the ones setting policy here. Um, so those looking to make extensions or like paving over garden grassland, really, like if we can be encouraging them to take up sort of vertical gardens or otherwise within their, their small space or chip into like local um, like biodiversity enhancement in, in the community, that sort of setting the precedent that every person matters, every little bit matters, and, and, and actually it will, that sort of thing would add up quite, quite significantly, so. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's two points there. I think the, the, the consultation response was about the mandatory biodiversity net gain of 10% and requiring someone building a house extension to go through this metric, I think probably would be unreasonable. But what we can still do through our own local policies is still require those people to do some biodiversity enhancement. It just wouldn't be measured in the same way. So what we could be doing through our local policies is saying, well, everybody needs to just picking something out here. Everyone needs to include bat boxes, bird boxes, bee bricks, those kind of things. Everybody should be having, you know, some green space as part of, of it. Those kind of things. We can do that through local policy and that's probably a much better way of actually helping the smaller scale developments to actually deliver the gains rather than trying to make them go through this sort of complicated spreadsheet, which most of them wouldn't understand and would be fairly meaningless to them anyway. But it doesn't mean to say we don't do it, we just do it in a different way. Sure, yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, uh, very useful. Councillor Alabone. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, uh, yes, picking up on what um, councillors Lee and Fedovic have said, the, uh, I'm a little bit intrigued as to how this is going to actually be quantified. I think the aspirations uh, are great, 10% increase in biodiversity. I mean, in, in my farm, obviously, organisations like DEFRA and the RPA, Rural Payments Agency, check on what I'm doing and how many Meter, hundreds of metres of hedges I've got and trees in hedge lines and crops, they do all that by satellite. But of course, you can't measure, you can't quantify biodiversity by satellite. 
developers don't have this specialist knowledge. It's something they're going to have to buy in. So I can just see there's going to be a spate of suitably accredited um, organizations that are going to help them with this. Uh, and obviously, this may well come up at the planning with at the pre-application stage, but I'm just hoping it isn't going to be a tick box exercise where they just find a, somebody who's just set up um, in response to this new legislation uh, and calling themselves some biodiversity experts um, so that it, it's just filling another form in. It, it's got to be it's got to be real. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd absolutely echo that. That's what we would obviously want to ensure that it isn't a tick box exercise. And that that's is going to be a challenge for every single local authority across the entire country about where we get this resource from. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. I can't see any other hands up. Um, so I think the members that we have here have discussed this well, unless there are any final comments people want to raise. Councillor Federer, I could see you slightly raising it, but I wasn't sure. Yes, yes, I, was, I thought I'd raise a digital hand. Um, yes, no, I just, um, I think I wanted to also go through like just a couple of um, other points and not necessarily questions, but um, but yeah, I mean, things like about buying the biodiversity credits, um, this sort of sets my teeth on edge a little bit. I know it's a very much last resort, but it's just a, a case of, um, a little bit sending us down a potentially dangerous road of, of developers thinking that they can buy their way out of biodiversity loss, which really uh, concerns me. But I know that we like there are going to be instances where they're sort of um, we, there's nothing else that we can do um, and that this is such an urgent development. But I think that really also comes back to um, if we can really think about, um, I don't know, working in sort of local policy in terms of um, what so ultimately, in 5.8, we mentioned about making an, um, it makes a note of preventing undue delays. So, I mean, in terms of developments and things like that, obviously in terms of housing, all of these other things, we need, we need development. We need certain things um, to come forward. However, um, we have a lot of space, um, uh, sort of empty um, buildings and things like that, especially following the coronavirus and sort of lockdown, spaces that need to be adapted places that have already been developed that need to be um, adapted to be something different. Um, and if we can actually utilize by sort of like um, net gain to push people into utilizing pre-developed spaces, um, I think this could be a fantastic tool for us because actually using this as a bit, bit of a delay, bit of red tape tactic to encourage people to go down a slightly easier route of, of utilizing some other land that's actually been pre-developed. Um, that could be a really powerful thing. I mean, obviously there are, if we could figure out some sort of way in policy to um, understand what our priority developments are um, and, and sort of where things would uh, not fall in line with that. For instance, anything that's going to be um, reducing like, uh, like a carbon reduction uh, program or something like that. Um, something that's actually going to directly impact something that we need urgently. Um, that might be something that we can think about. Um, but really, like, I think this could be very powerful in, in changing that shift and making people look at um, other developments um, or just like changing change of use and stuff like that. Um, so that was just one thing that I really wanted to bring up. Um, I'm just going to my notes quickly, bear with me. Um, um yeah i think i've covered a lot of that actually um yeah that that's i think that's probably the main the main point actually yeah that's it. yeah i can respond to a couple of those things obviously there's, there's a lot in there i mean the, the the local nature recovery strategy is is going to be the main tool for us identifying what our real priorities are um and i think it, it's not about thinking of the biodiversity units or the biodiversity credits as necessarily a bad thing because what we need is, is a mixture of stuff. So it's really, really important to get things delivered on site and, and near local people. So people have access to local green space and all the benefits that that gives to them. But offsite things can also give us an opportunity to do landscape scale habitat creation, which we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And they can offer us really exciting opportunities to create something new and something great and something better. So we, we need the blend of the two. 
and I think sometimes you know planning is always a complicated thing about balancing um, priorities and on a site sometimes for example um, you might find that in terms of the, the the priority for open space on that site might be that there's there's really no sports pitches in the in the in the local area and actually what you really need is not a wildflower meadow on the site but it's actually a, a football pitch because there's no football pitches in the area and in that case it might be better to provide that football pitch on the site and actually provide the wildflower meadow somewhere else as an extension to an existing wildflower meadow to create that and, and create that enhancement so that off-site thing might actually be the right thing and the better thing to do so it's about looking at the individual circumstances the individual site and doing that planning balance that we do all the time of getting the right answer for the right site at the right time yeah. okay great thank you um so look i think we've given that a really good discussion it's obviously peaked uh, you know brought about a lot of thoughts for members um, and officers alike I'm sure and people who are watching at home because um, it is an important development that we're seeing I'm sure we'll all be following it closely and I would suspect that as this develops over coming months years we'll look at this again um, as a panel I'm sure just because it is um, very interesting so thank you everybody and officers for going through that with us. Um, really appreciate it. We're going to move on to the next agenda item, which is a another very local one. Um, we're going to be talking about the town deal board um, for Corby in particular, a uh, specific part of the project relating to the, the link road. So I am believe I'm handing over to um, Val for this. I think I can see you on the screen. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, we have Mike here today from KWSP that's um, going to give a better overview of it. Um, but I'll just give a little bit of background for anyone that's not familiar with the town fund. Um, in September 2019, it was announced that Corby was selected as one of over 100 towns to take part in the government's town fund initiative um, to unlock the economic potential of these towns. Um, Corby Borough Council was invited to bid for up to 25 million for local projects to improve our town. Um, Corby's bid was um, set out in the town investment plan um, that was submitted to government in January 2021. In June 2021, uh, North Northamptonshire Council was successfully awarded 19.9 million for four projects detailed in the town investment plan. Um, two of these projects were combined due to their similarities around uh, active travel. Um, these were the Town Centre to Station Link Road and Smart and Connected Corby. Um, so I'll uh, hand over to Mike, um, who will give an overview. Um, he's been part of the team pro progressing these projects through to the next stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Val. Um, and hello to everybody. I'm just going to try and share my screen, if that's okay. Um, I've not done this before, so we'll see how this goes. Um, so... Can everybody see the screen with the slide on it? Yeah, we can see that. Yeah, excellent. That's great. Thank you. So, yeah, so this is about the uh, Corby Link Road and the uh, Connecting Corby projects um, that Val just spoke about. So um, we've been working on this um, since just before Christmas. Um, we were given um, a very tight deadline of preparing a design and a business case um for the, the the route from the railway station in Corby through to the town centre so this was a scheme identified by Lambert Smith and Hampton um, and they identified two routes to improve the connectivity between the station and the town centre on the screen you can see the two routes one is um from the station which is where the heart is around route a um, the blue section, which is labelled five, and the pink section, that's labelled number four. Um, and then the other route was the route labelled one in orange, two in yellow, and three in red. Um, the route selected to take forward was the route showing as one, two, and three, 
Um, primarily, this is because it passes the entrance to Tresham College and the route to the north um, was likely to be um, very constrained and challenging because of the number of uh, accesses we have to deal with there, which would increase the potential for conflict between road users and the space requirements uh, along the edge of the footway. So that, that's the, the, the scheme we've decided to take forward. Um, and then sort of, the, like I said, that, that what's shown there is the program. Um, ideally, we would have liked to have had a bit more time to do this because we would have preferred to go out and get a bit more data um, to make the design of the business case more robust. Um, but um, we are where we are and this is what we've got to do. With. So we started off, like I say, just before December doing the design and then with the objective of completing the business case and the design by the end of March. At the end of February, we were on programme to do that. Um, and then um, a decision was made to also incorporate the um, Connecting Corby project, project four, into the same business case. And we've now had a revised deadline of the end of April, which looks like we're on track to do. A couple of interesting challenges we had there um, was the design was required to comply with the new standards for uh, footways and cycleways called LTM 120. Um, and there was also a desire to provide um, an accessible ramp between Oakley Road and the railway station car park. Um, they became extremely challenging, um, but we've, we've managed to do that um, in terms of the one LTM 120. However, the provision of an accessible ramp to the station car park, we looked at again and it, it would appear that um, we're not going to be able to do that um, because of land constraints and, and costs. So we've identified a potential alternative to that, which is to take the route um, up around um, the Oakley Road and then, um, I forget the name of that road at the top there, it's gone blank but um into the station car park itself and the, the additional route is a little bit more flatter and um it's more accessible and for all road users on the whole and it's only a, an extra 100 meters longer the works we've completed today like i say are the um design is completed we've done a scheme cost estimate uh, and we're now looking at um the identification of advanced works that can be can be undertaken between now and um, the funds being released to take the scheme forward if it's successful in its application. The business case has already also been drafted and is with um, North Northamptonshire and their um, subject matter experts for review. Um, I believe Val's collating those comments back uh, and going to provide them to us so we can get those incorporated and the documents updated and reissued. So the scheme itself, um, the scheme starts at Elizabeth Street on um, the point where it joins Corporation Street, which I think is, um, I think it's Stuart Road, is it? Um, which is, yeah, um, yeah, Stuart Road, which is just slightly north of Stuart Road. So our proposals are to replace the existing two-stage crossing um, at that location with a single parallel crossing uh, on a raised table. So that connects the residential side of uh, Elizabeth Street on the east with the retail side on the west. Um, the speed table will also act as a measure to slow vehicles down. The pedestrian facilities would then, also uh, the pedestrian and cycle facilities would then continue down the eastern side of Elizabeth Street using a two meter wide footway and a three meter wide um, cycleway. This is all in compliant with LTM 120. Um, it's probably worth pointing out at this stage, um, we have developed um, what we would call two cost options for this. So we've, we've developed what we call the minimum standard pallet of materials option, which is obviously a, a lower cost is, uh, scheme and um, a realistic, um, higher quality of materials or higher standard of materials um, obviously because we believe you know if you provide a, a, um, a better uh, quality 
public realm, um, it, it obviously has more beneficial effects socially and things. So as you can see there, that's just a couple of samples of the materials we're looking at on the screen. So you can, for your foot paths, you can have tegular block paving, or you can just have bituminous uh, footways, um, or new curbs can go from your simple concrete curbs to your um, reconstituted concrete and granite curbs there. So moving down Elizabeth Street, we come to just north of the existing roundabout at um, Saint, where, where it joins uh, Anne Street. We're proposing to put in a new parallel crossing here on a raised table. Um, again, that connects the existing um, pedestrian access from the town centre car park to the residential area on the east of Elizabeth Street. And it also would act as a, uh, another vehicle calming measure. Um, it would come at the cost of, cost of a loss of one or two car parking spaces that are currently on street on Elizabeth Street. The next challenge we have is outside the United Reform Church. Currently, the foot width here is three metres. And as I've said previously, we need five meters to put in a LTM 120 compliant design. Um, we have two options here. The preferred option would be to relocate the existing roundabout slightly west, um, as this would give, create sufficient room to provide a, a compliant standard all the way through. If that wasn't to be possible, then we are we would seek to um, apply for I guess an approved departure, which is to have a shared facility at that location over a short stretch. The next um, feature we would put in along Elizabeth Street would be a third new raised crossing um, just south of the Ann Street roundabout. We, we noticed from site observations when we went to site, there was a desire line for um, pedestrians to come from Anne Street and cross Elizabeth Street and continue down Oakley Road. This was predominantly, um, from observations, seen to be pedestrians and school children. So we feel that would be another um, asset to put that feature in there, as it would also provide that desire line and reduce vehicle speeds from vehicles coming off the roundabout at Oakley Road. The next uh, feature we come to is the roundabout connecting Oakley Road and Elizabeth Street. Unfortunately, um, to provide the facility at this location here, we are required to remove the existing um, verge at the edge of the footway. Um, however, we believe we can offset that by um, providing um, additional landscaping within the roundabout and the highway verges itself. We feel that the, an advantage here would be to use that using um, wild seed mixes. Um, this would benefit the local ecosystems and provide additional habitat for bees, butterflies and various insects as well. The next proposal is actually on Oakley Road itself. Oakley Road itself, there is an existing pedestrian crossing just off the roundabout. Um, we would seek to upgrade that to be a Toucan crossing. This would then connect the proposed cycle facilities on the north of Oakley Road with the existing shared facility on the southern side of Oakley Road. We would also seek to widen the existing shared facility to three metres to continue that round to the existing uh, two can crossing that's on Oakley Road, what I refer to as Oakley Road South, um, just by KFC down there. Moving on to the next part of Oakley Road, um, we come to the, oh, what's the name of the road? It's a summit drive, isn't it? Um, oh, what's the name of the road down there? The underpass. By, by Burley. The, Burley. Burley Road, that's it, Burley, Burley Drive, that's it. Um, we come down to, to the underpass by Burley Drive. We would seek to um, remove that underpass um, because we've upgraded the um, Toucan Crossing just immediately to the west of that. 
that gives us a great opportunity to um, replace the area that's currently occupied by the approach ramps on the south side with a new landscaped area containing trees um, and new vegetation and planting. The northern uh, approach ramps are a little bit more challenging in this respect in as far as to provide to uh, sort of infill this ramp and provide the necessary width for the um, new facility we would have to remove some of this planting between um, Oakley Road and the properties on Cooper Crescent here um, Whilst that has a short term negative impact, um, we would want to turn it into a positive by then proposing a more bespoke and um, detailed landscaping proposal there and screening. So we are conscious that initially there may be some concerns about the visibility of the road from the properties here um, due to the removal of some of the planting. The Next feature we, we uh, would come across is potentially the loss of the on-street parking here um, at East Avenue. Um, this would require, because of the need to sort of provide the widened footway cycleway here, it would mean the loss of a couple of parking spaces. Um, obviously, we would want to go and consult with the residents um, and stakeholders to see what their views with that are if it was felt the parking at this location uh, was required because there is very little parking around that area for the properties that face Oakley Road, then we would seek to relocate the existing bus stop and lay by further east along Oakley Road. The next um, part of Oakley Road is just as we start to approach the railway bridge. Um, here we have an interesting dilemma because the uh, existing verge and the carriageway are at different levels at this point here. So, oh, sorry, it's also worth pointing out the existing pedestrian underpass underneath the railroad bridge is constrained as well. So to overcome this, um, we would seek to start to diverge the footpath and the cycleway, um, placing the cycleway at carriageway level it would still remain segregated but it would be at the carriageway level and it would pass then beneath the railway bridge before rejoining um, the footway at the existing Toucan crossing a couple of things to sort of point out there so we've also got um, an existing obstruction here with two trees. The distance between these two mature trees is about one meter. So we would probably look to see if we could speak with the arboriculturist and remove this tree here. This tree um, doesn't look to be in the best of health, but um, I'm no tree expert, so I would take advice. And this tree seems to be a lot more mature and in better health. So it may be, again, the loss of that little tree there. We would seek to mitigate this by infilling the gaps in, in, the, in the tree bank on the southern side of Oakley Road with new trees uh, and species as well. So we're looking to offset as much of the, um, the, the, the damage we're doing here with, with removing trees with new trees and new facilities elsewhere. Um, the underpass beneath the railway line for pedestrians, we feel there's not much we can do here due to its construction um, other than look to improve and repair the existing lighting. This is something that we would have to liaise with um, Network Rail with and um, the council's street lighting department. Um, other than that, you know, as far as underpasses go, it's not too bad, I have to say. The the steps I spoke about earlier, um, you can see here, um, we are very confined with space. Um, the existing bank is already um, fairly steep and it should be 
noted that these steps were put in in around 2013 and I believe that is a cabinet paper uh, where the provision of ramps at this location was discussed um, and as we found when we've looked at it again under this scheme um, to put the ramps in would be cost prohibitive and have a big impact on the station car park itself it is likely to remove some of the parking base to get the ramp in there um, to, to give you an idea of what we're talking about here, um, the distance for somebody um, in a wheelchair or a mobility scooter here to travel up a ramp from this point here to the station building uh, would be about 100 metres shorter than travelling up the, the main road and turning left um, and then going into the front of the station there. So that's the, pretty much a, a whistle-stop tour of the uh, station link design. The connected Corby design, uh, or the facility here, um, this is where we're looking to install somewhere in the region of 20 to 25 air and traffic monitoring data uh, sensors that would then link back to a public accessible dashboard so people could see you know um, the movement of traffic and, and potentially the air quality in the area um, this data would also then be useful for the authority in identifying any hot spots and monitoring the success of, of programs and um, targeting schemes to reduce congestion improve air quality and the like um, the sites would have to be located potentially on new posts, but um, on new locations. But we would look to use existing infrastructure like street lighting columns and the like to mount the sensors on. Um, and they would be likely to be very minimal disruption because most of the sensors work off um, Wi-Fi and 3G, 4G and 5G. Uh, and that's just a, a snapshot of one of the dashboards that are available on the market to to sort of identify air quality and traffic movements. Um, noting that this was a, a, a climate um, focused meeting, um, I've just sort of produced a slide really to sort of outline the opportunities um, that the scheme brings in terms of climate and health. So the, the proposed design was compliant with the new guidelines for pedestrians and, and safe cycling facilities. Um, the new crossings we're putting obviously prioritise pedestrians and cyclists over vehicles, uh, and that is in line with the recent changes to the highway code uh, hierarchy users. Um, the, the segregated facilities um, we think would help support and encourage those with less experience to get on their bikes and walk. Um, you know, if you're a, a cyclist who is a bit nervous or has less experience, you're not likely to be sort of keen to jump on your bike and travel against the side of moving traffic and stuff. So having these things separated um, makes it a little bit safe for people. Um, the, the space needed for those segregated facilities isn't going to be taken from um, the verges and the soft landscape areas where it can be done. And we would look to take the space needed from the carriageway, particularly on Oakley Road. Oakley Road at the moment is about 7.5 metres wide in each direction. We would look to reduce that carriageway down to 6.5 metres in either direction and narrow the median. So that would help um, or that would create the space from that. And in doing that, the bituminous materials from the carriageway excavation we we are hoping subject to testing we could reuse that in the construction of the new segregated facility, facilities so that would lower the amount needed for or amount of new materials to be mined from quarries and things for sub base and that sort of stuff um, the refresh of the public realm areas, particularly in Elizabeth Street, um, we think would create a more pleasant environment and that would entice people to feel, well, actually, it's a nice place to, to walk and ride my bike along this area. So we think that would have a social benefit. And the scheme itself, because it is fully compliant with LTM 120, it's a good launching point from where we can then take future schemes going um, down further down Oakley Road. Uh, and making the connectivity of active travel measures a little bit better. 
um, and the like I said before the the introduction of the connected Corby scheme would establish the baseline of um, uh, motorists, cyclists, and all the types of road users, so we can monitor the success of the scheme and how those active travel measures are performing. And it would also give us um, real-time information regarding the air quality. Um, so that's very, very quickly the, um, the schemes, the benefits in terms of climate and health. Um, so is there any questions, I guess? Perfect. Thank you for taking us um, through that. Just quickly before moving on to questions, thank you to Councillor Norman. Um, I can see you've joined us um, as this is of importance in regard to your portfolio. So the first hand up is Councillor O'Hara. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm late joining you today. Um, just a few questions, really. <clears throat> I, I go down this area quite frequently. Um, the problem with Oakley Road is that it gets very, very congested. Um, with students attending Tresham College yep. Um, yep. and a lot of those students um, or some of those students have to travel um, most mostly by parents but then they finish earlier so they will go and get the train so I think it's a fab idea because the students can then walk a bit more safely. The underpass that goes from um, Oakley Road from near the school um, that underpass is, is, is not the most salubrious of areas. So I think that would be quite nice to see that eradicated and planted up. That would be lovely. That will enhance the area at no end. And as regards East Avenue, our observation is that I think there's only two houses down there that haven't got parking at the front. Most of them have two parking spaces out the front. They've converted their gardens. I'm sure there's only two or three houses down there that haven't, I only know because I've got a friend who lives down there. Um, so I, I don't know that the residents would be too perturbed by that and would, would, would welcome actually getting rid of all the, for what the better word is, shrubland. And it's, yeah. it's a lot of hawthorn down there that's very unwieldy and very hard to maintain unless it's looked after regularly, as in, you know, bi-monthly, really. Mm. Um, so I think the scheme, considering the time you've had to come up with it, is fabulous. Um, welcome anything whereby you can get people out of their cars and onto their bikes and, and walking and and I think in a Covid world so many people are enjoying the outside and they've got used to being out on their bikes and walking rather than using the car and given the cost of fuel nowadays anything we can do to reduce people's cost of living and enhance their health has got to be a massive yeah. benefit so I'm really appreciative of the work you've done and what we're doing within our remit and um, what North North Ants are doing is fabulous to uh, bring this forward and, and get it done. Um, my only concern is o um, Oakley Road, as I said, is very busy. And the underpass that we can't do anything with, you know, where, where the trains go over, it, yes, it's unsightly because it's very 1950s, dare I say. Um, and that then leads down to Tesco's, which is where most of the students go to get their lunch. Um, so, you know, it will enhance that area for the students as well. And I feel it will make it safer um, because within these underpasses, they're never very safe, whether you're a student or an adult, mm. whichever. Um, and also a lot of children cross over there to go to the Exeter school. So yeah. I think improving that area at no end and planting it up will be wonderful. And I wonder if perhaps we could even, whether this would add to the problem or, or not, whether we could even get the school involved and have a little area that children can look after mm -hmm. to involve the community, because Kilby is very communi community orientated. You know, and we've done, you know, we're looking after this area, taking care of the, the bees, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, uh, so I just wondered whether that's something we could look at, that not that I want them to maintain it, but just, you know, if we're going to spread wild, wild birds, the wildflower seeds, etc., whether that's something we can look at in terms of um, and getting the children involved. And then the other thing that I was uh, thinking of was that you're thinking about reusing the bitumen materials. Um, I, I know that you're thinking of like a concrete curbstone or, or, or a mix, um, whether it be granite or whatever, but whatever's most sustainable, whichever has longevity. Mm. Um, obviously, I, I don't imagine you can use the materials that you're going to take out of the underpass or, or how you're going to infill that underpass. I don't quite know how you do it. I'm not an engineer. Um, but anything we can do to reuse and, and uh, upcycle, if you like, it is fabulous. Yeah. So I just wanted to congratulate you really on coming up with this scheme in such a, a, a timious manner. 
and um, and say it, it, it is fabulous. It's fabulous that you're going to segregate people as well and bikes because it's quite disconcerting for people who are less mobile. The bike comes flying along. I, I yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, one thing I didn't realise I, I went to site was obviously um, Northamptonshire uh, uh, trialling the, the Voli scooters as well. And yes. the future of them, I'm not too sure about. And I don't think anybody's at the minute. I mean, there's talk of that they are going to be allowed. The trials appear to be successful. So, again, a lot the of people do use different. them. Yeah. So if it gets expanded out to Corby uh, and they are used, I think the biggest problem we have, and forgive me for saying it, it is that people aren't always... Um, careful as to where they deposit their mm. vehicles when they finish with them, whether it be a, a, a scooter or, or a bike. And I think if they were around the college area, um, mm -hmm. you might find more and more students use them, but it's down to cost and how much their parents give them for, for transport. But I know for my son, you know, it's expensive if he, ha if he has to get a train and I just adjust my work times to try and accommodate mm. being able to pick him up. So anything you can do to improve along that area is fabulous and, and you know, long may it continue. And, it, and it'd be lovely to see Elizabeth Street um you know redevelop but my, my question was what happens about the railings if you're going to reposition the pedestrian area it's difficult for parents to get over there as it is you've got a garage and you've got kfc there and and the traffic flow that comes from corby town center from the market harbor area is quite heavy at times so it's it's the timings it's going to be a two camp crossing i don't know quite how that will work coming off a roundabout i know there's uh, rules and objectives there yeah, so just to answer the first question, the, the railings will remain. The The speed limit on Oakley Road would be reduced to 30 miles an hour. Um, the, what, the reason for that is twofold, really. One, the narrowing of the, of the carriageway lanes and the fact we, at the um, eastern end of Oakley Road by the railway, we, we have that situation where the cycleway is at the carriageway level. So, again, we would look to, to reduce the speed limit on up to 30 miles an hour. Um, and yes, and now in the meeting down, we would still want to keep the railings in there. We've had several conversations about that. Uh, and as we know, uh, students and children would be children. They will always walk the, the shortest route and crossing the road, particularly yeah. dual carriageway, even with a 30 mile hour speed limit, we still feel is a, um, a risk we wouldn't want to take and a safety issue we would want to uh, mitigate. And may I ask if the rains are going to remain because they're quite high and the reason they were put in high was to stop students climbing over them. Yes, yeah, it's our high. intent to, to re keep those railings in. I mean, we would re renew them. We wouldn't keep the old uh, ones in there. We would replace them with new ones. Oh, that's what I wanted to hear. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is about a ramp. Uh, by the way, I, I love the design. It, it will be a great improvement. But I'd like to talk about a ramp to the car park for wheelchair users. Uh, I find it disturbing that you're considering not doing this. I mean, 100 yards is a very big detour. Um, is this in line with our public sector equality duty if we don't have that ramp? Have you checked with uh, wheelchair users? Uh, I believe there is a Centre for Independent Living in Corby. Have you checked with them uh, how they feel about it? And would that be legal not to have a ramp? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Councillor Lee. Um, I can I share your concerns. Um, I, I have done a number of these equality impact assessments for um various railway schemes and we've looked at these things um i we've also checked with the um northamptonshire um accessibility officers um and it is possible to do that because we 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 feel we're able to demonstrate that and we've looked at the options and um the the cost and the impact of providing a ramp at that location um is disproportionate to the scheme um, and we've analysed the alternative routes. Um, we would of course look at it again in the next stage of the design, um, bearing in mind that this, you know, we only had a few weeks to do this uh, initial design um, because I, you know, I wouldn't want to just rule something out at this early stage, but um, so far um, it's looking like we can't do it and I wouldn't want to present a solution to you folks on the call that sort of gave you false expectations. Uh, I'll take advice on this. It just doesn't seem that we are 
complying with our duty, with the equality duty of, of providing a, a space that is also usable by wheelchair users. But I will take advice on that. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, and if, if you get anything different, please let me know. Okay, thank you. Um, just checking which hand up. Uh, Councillor Federovich. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to first of all say how incredibly excited I am to see this and how fantastic it is. Um, yeah, the, and the fact that you've done this in such a short space of time is, is really commendable. Thank you so, so much for all the, the hard work you've put into it. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I actually I have a question from Councillor Dell, who wasn't able to make today. Uh, he's unfortunately suffering with the Rona. Um, but uh, he was wanting to know about the, the streets that feed into this and how they, they might be made compliant as well, or if that's part of it. Um, I was struggling to find that on the uh, documents as well. Um, yes, it's always a difficult question because where do you stop a scheme? Um, I'll be totally honest, we, we haven't been asked to look at that, uh, the additional streets, but um, that is kind of what I was referring to when I said, you know, this is a, a starting point, you know, you can then develop, this is the, the basis from which all other streets lead to. Um, so the short answer is we haven't considered connectivity with the adjacent streets, but there is that opportunity potential to expand it if the funding is there. No, I mean, that's sort of what I was, when you said that as well, I, I think it's one of those things that you can just sort of build off and it, you sort of, you prove the, the need for it, don't you? But um, also I uh, wanted, well, first of all, on the air monitoring devices, that's absolutely brilliant. And the, the transparency of that being connected to um, like publicly viewable things, brilliant. Um, uh, the underpass as well. Um, I didn't know, because you sort of said that the, the main thing there to be improved with this was the... Um, the lighting but I I was just wondering about the the surface itself and if that was something that was going to be looked at or if it needed it it, it might not it just it looked a little bit like it might do in the pictures but yes so, so the surfacing under the so the, the structure itself is that those panels uh, are actually bolted together so um, there will be a need to maintain access to those um, components to make sure the bolts aren't rusting out and everything else so you could probably paint it, um, but like anything, you know, um, you paint it white to make it nice and light and airy, then somebody will come along and graffiti it. And uh, I have to say, of all the underpasses, that one isn't in too bad a condition. There's very little graffiti in there. I think that's um, connected with the surface as well. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. I, I mean, I'm keen to do something in there, but we're limited to what we can do. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think just echoing also what some of the other councillors have said about um, getting the community engaged massively. So, like, uh, it's one of those things, if you can get the community even involved in some way to sort of take a bit of ownership over it, um, you might even get some volunteers to help with a bit of uh, painting or something like that if it needed mm. it. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, that was the other thing as well in terms of the community and um yeah, the widening of sort of like the bridge alleyway. And, and obviously, it doesn't look particularly like great quality um yeah sort of like not really a like wildlife area is it but but yeah widening that um obviously you've got some other areas that you're going to be um planting up with trees and things like that is that really where you're going to be looking to put the wildflower seed mix or it wasn't really clear where that location for the offset was going to be but i just wanted to clarify the along oakley road uh, when so when you you were saying you were about losing the verge on the corner. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. So and I, the I wild about, uh, let me just see. I don't know if you can still see my screen. I can flick back to the roundabout. Yeah, that that'd be super. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So you've got the verge here. Um, yeah. That would could be, and you've got all around the roundabout in here. Okay. You got there. There's also. Um, we would want to try and speak to the grounds maintenance teams for the flats here because they've got quite a large expanse of green there and if we could potentially put some a buffer in there of landscaping in there it'll be nice yeah brilliant okay well thank you thank you councillor lee is your hand 
Yes, I, I just wanted to add about that ramp for the wheelchair users. It's pushchair mm-hmm. it's pushchair users as well, parents with children. Yeah. I mean, in Kettering uh, Station, we've got two car parks, and one is 100 meters further than the other one. Mm. I'd be very dismayed if I'd only be able to choose the furthest car park um, mm. because I had a pushchair, because uh, that would make me more vulnerable as well with my pushchair pushing the children yeah. um, to, to so I cannot emphasize strongly enough that that rump is definitely worth uh, losing a couple of parking spaces in my opinion um, absolutely I, you know I, I yeah I, I understand your concerns Councillor Lee and um, yeah we will make sure we look at that in more depth with the relevant offices within Northamptonshire North Northamptonshire Council and the requirements of the Disability Act that's lovely thank you Thank you. And I, I just remembered I wanted to come back on a couple of points Councillor Federovich had raised and around connectivity and um, encouraging more cycling and walking. Um, and I I'm, I would have thought that this would be looked at in the round um, in terms of the LC WIP development as we move forward um, in Corby to, to make sure that we're making the best of that. And there was another point on the around the underpass. And actually, I can see one of the officers has commented exactly what I was going to to raise, which was the fantastic piece of artwork that was commissioned um, to, I suppose, do up one of the underpasses as part of the Greenway in Rushton, um, using local artists to make a a mural that really spoke of kind of the history of that area. Um, And so, as the officer has quite rightly said, potential to look at that and see what we could do here has has good potential and, and would be able to bring the community into that um, yeah yeah I couldn't agree more because on the approach we must we not be able to do anything inside the underpass underneath the railway there is some very high walls there that we could sort of put murals and things on as well and get that done by you know students at the college or local artists and things so yeah it just hasn't been the focus of our design to date um I'm sorry if that's disappointed people, but uh, I'll be being honest. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so that, that was really useful and um, another good one to, to get some discussion and, and thoughts from members. So there are no other hands up that I can see. Um, so on that note, we will come to the close of the meeting. Again, thank you to officers for all their hard work in putting together the presentations Um, to provide for us and thank you again to members for all your input um, on this the date of the next meeting I'm just flicking back is the 18th of May Um, so I will see you all then